The need for air supremacy over the past 60 years has been an intermittent yet driving force in the development of fighter aircraft. And one by one, certain design and performance characteristics became the criteria against which new fighters were developed. Now for the first time, a practical, multi-mission fighter emerges that balances all the criteria required for a successful fighter. When you consider that man had just succeeded in sustaining powered flight for a matter of seconds in 1903, it was more astounding that in 1917, an agile flying machine mounting synchronized guns was influencing the outcome of large-scale war on the Western Front and forging a doctrine of air supremacy that would affect the conduct and outcome of all subsequent wars. Air battles, ever since, have been won by aggressive pilots in aircraft that either enhanced or limited their chances for victory. Success in aerial combat was related to their ability to see the enemy first, put him on the defensive, outperform, and destroy him. While the maneuverings of Lufbery and Immelman have not changed, design characteristics that would allow the pilot to keep track of the enemy once he was found, then outmaneuver and outlast him, were to influence the development and success of every fighter in the years to come. It took 20 years and the certainty of war in Europe to obsolete the biplane and cause the development of two all-metal low-wing fighters, the ME-109 and the Spitfire each earning a legendary place in history during the Battle of Britain. Common to all fighters of boundary-conscious European nations, the Spit and 109 were both short-legged defensive machines. The ME-109 could outclimb and outdive the Spit, enjoyed some altitude advantage, had longer-range armament, but visibility from its small canopy was quite poor. The Spitfire, with better visibility, was slightly faster, having excellent handling qualities and outstanding high-altitude maneuverability. Its excellent turning ability and its firepower proved decisive in the air war over Britain. Agility, then as now, meant responsive aircraft with superior acceleration and tight turning characteristics. Beyond the skies over England, however, long-range strategic bombing missions deep into enemy territory were suffering dramatic losses for lack of escort protection the defensive fighter could not furnish. Three U.S. fighters progressively solved this problem. Of the P-38, P-47, and P-51, it was the 51 with large internal fuel capacity that was able to accompany heavy bombers to the extreme limits of their operations. The Mustang combined the best climbing, turning, and diving characteristics of European fighters, had much improved visibility, and produced a kill ratio of 7 to 1. As the most versatile fighter of World War II, the P-51 added the criteria for endurance to future fighter development. In the Pacific, Japanese pilots were flying lightweight Zeros that displayed an exceptional combination of maneuverability and range, but could sustain little in the way of battle damage. Yet in 
even though our own Navy fighters, like the durable Hellcats and Corsairs, were less maneuverable than the Zero, their ruggedness and heavier firepower provided the margin of victory. Grumman Hellcats, in particular, achieving a kill ratio of 19 to 1. Post-war fighter development went into the doldrums much as it did after the First World War, with one exception, the Russians, recognizing the decisiveness of air superiority in World War II, intensified their development of fighters, and less than five years later, the U.S. experienced the growing technological know-how of its former World War II ally when F-86s engaged superior Soviet-built MiG-15s in Korea. After flying from Seoul to the Alu, it was only a better trained and experienced combat pilot using improved tactics in a rugged swept-wing saber that maintained a margin of air superiority over North Korea. Although air combat over Korea still used close-in weapons, guns and rockets, it was now jet-powered, and the relatively tight turn of World War II was getting larger. The criteria for turning capability, range and visibility that evolved from fighters past became even more critical in this conflict. By 1953, when the Korean War ended, the Soviets had already put their next MiG, the 17, into service and then methodically produced the MiGs 19 and 21, all in a five-year period. And the U.S. has faced all three of these highly maneuverable fighters in Vietnam. For the first time in the history of air combat, Vietnam saw the use of guided missiles as the primary air-to-air -air weaponry. U.S. fighters using mid-range Sparrow missiles were able to destroy enemy aircraft beyond visual contact using a radar weapon system that detects, acquires, launches, and guides this missile to the target. When close-in combat was experienced, the infrared guided Sidewinder accounted for most MiGs destroyed by U.S. fighters. U.S. lead in this technology paid dividends in the early stages of air combat, but then the North Vietnamese reached parity by using ground-controlled hit-and-run tactics. Only improved command and control and intensified air combat training regained U.S. advantage. The F-4 Phantom just barely held its own in this electronically dominated airspace because it is an interceptor used as a fighter, finding it difficult to compete with a fighter designed as a fighter. Holding our own has been a matter of complicated tactics, intensive training, and two able men offsetting hardware deficiencies. This is an expensive and time-consuming remedy and would be futile if we found ourselves either without the time to accomplish it or up against an enemy with equal or superior skills coupled with better machines. Every fighter pilot from the very first gunslinger who flew a wood and wire crate at treetop level to today's manager of a very complicated weapon system knows that air combat is not just weapon against weapon. It is a matter of skill and judgment, courage and aggressiveness. It is knowing those things about his own machine that might kill him rather than the enemy, a knowing of weaknesses in the enemy's airplane to be exploited, and having a healthy respect for the enemy's capability. There is little way for the layman to experience the air combat environment, but one way to capture something of this violence is to sense visual relationships using motion picture cameras, installing them where the viewer can account for his own airplane the terrain, the horizon and sky, and the enemy all at once. Flying like you plan to fight is the jargon of simulated combat. One man, 
in an F-8 against two in an F-4. Crusader against Phantom, standard Navy fighters. The imperative, find the other guy first. Having achieved initial firing position because of its better radar, the F-4 gets first advantage. Tally ho, nine o'clock, low, six miles. To counter the Phantom's advantage, the Crusader must execute a defensive turn. The F-8 pilot meets the Phantom head on. Now all the action is outside the cockpit. Dogfighting is the order of things now, and both crews are concerned with exactly what Rickenbacker and von Richthofen were concerned with over half a century ago. Position, angle off, airspeed, get the enemy on the defensive. The fighter pilot does not always have the luxury of deciding how and when he will meet the enemy, but once engaged, there is but one alternative. Destroy him before he destroys you. The classic dogfight involving two or more jet fighters is a brief fuel-consuming encounter at best and must reach its conclusion within several minutes. It is the engagement of last resort, the least desirable, most demanding way to fight for man and machine. Never underestimating his opponent, the fighter pilot must judge the maneuvering ability of his adversary during the first seconds of the engagement. From that point on, he must continuously and rapidly predict his opponent's strategy and be able to counter effectively. The Phantom and Crusader are conventional fighters, and in this violent arena of changing speed, altitude, and G-forces, both experience less than optimum wing performance most of the time, only because their respective wings are fixed for best performance in a small band of the tactical envelope. Their different energy levels give each distinct advantages at different altitudes, and this reflects on the skill of the pilot and the performance of the airplane as well. Keeping visual contact and never looking in his cockpit for one moment, he must also assess the effects of sun and clouds and include these in his own battle strategy. All this will occur during extreme and rapid altitude changes from the deck to 35,000 feet, and he will experience equally rapid and debilitating physical forces on his whole system from zero to seven Gs. While undergoing these conditions, he must not think about flying his own machine, or where the horizon is, or whether he's right side up or upside down, or whether the machinery is working or not working, whether it's stalling or not stalling, his whole consciousness glued to the enemy's airplane. During an average 120-second fight, he may get two or perhaps three brief opportunities to destroy his opponent. And in these seconds, he will have to select the most effective weapon at his disposal, fitting range, speed, and angle off to the circumstance of the moment. In his total involvement, he must never forget that enough fuel must be preserved to get back to home base. If the battle has not been joined and fuel reserves dictate disengaging, the fighter could be destroyed in its escape. Running out of fuel is tantamount to a kill for the opponent. Today's air combat training involved two airplanes. Tomorrow it could be four or six. The goal is to teach the pilot every fighter tactic in the book, never to consider being on the defensive, to exploit and become one with his own machine to exploit the weaknesses of the adversary and his machine. All this against a day when an enemy and whatever fighter he may put in the air can be met with confidence. Air superiority, a rapidly advancing technology available to everyone, is a transient value, but maintaining it needs defining and redefining in terms of the enemy environment. Reviewing for a brief moment, this highly maneuverable swept wing MiG-21 is an air superiority fighter better than any in our operational inventory. Since its initial design was laid down in the early 1950s as an uncluttered Mach 2 home defense day fighter, there has been a dramatic technical and political shift in Russian design philosophy. But the immediate Soviet aircraft threat 
comprises an advanced generation of fighters already in existence and the prototype development of several even newer types. Barger, a swing-wing frontline tactical fighter is operational. This is an aircraft operating at altitudes up to 50,000 feet at speeds of Mach 2.3 also possessing maneuverability and a combat radius in excess of the F-4 Phantom. Foxbat, a new extended performance fighter, is now operational and has been seen in an area of potential conflict. It is thought to have multiple air-to-air -air and long-range air-to-surface missile capability at a speed of Mark III. More important, however, we currently have no fighter in our operational inventory that could consistently, if successfully, combat the Foxbat. Of the two, the Foxbat has substantially widened the combat spectrum, has amplified the need for air defense, and the absolute requirement to respond to more rapidly changing situations in a much enlarged envelope. In the meantime, a much newer problem faces even our most contemporary solution to containing the broad spectrum of Soviet air threats. And that's a generation of advanced tactical aircraft which further expands the performance of known Soviet fighters and missiles. This expanding Soviet technology includes launching cruise missiles against U.S. operations, not only from aerial platforms, but from highly mobile surface units as well. Nevertheless, the overall Soviet threat does not come as a surprise. It is a long-term product of determination and technological predictability. And while each element of the overall threat requires management, the largest responsibility for containing it lies in the realm of the fighter. Actual combat is the proving ground of last resort that tests the ability of fighting men and machines, a dynamic experience that isolates and emphasizes the need for improved aircraft that do not penalize either the air crew or the mission. So I think we do have shortcoming. I think the F-8, uh, for the state of the art that it, uh, it put forth, quite fine. But that was 15 years ago. We don't have that today. We need a new airplane to, to cope with a new threat, ECM and uh, non-ECM environment. The threat has gone well beyond that. It's a multi-plane attack with a bunch of missiles, uh, very coordinated, a lot of ECM, a very sophisticated attack, and it takes a, a tough system to handle that. Now, it's not a one-on-one -on -one situation. So I think the first thing that, that we should look for in a fighter or in any airplane that we buy is a real meaningful range. And I think uh, five, 600 miles doesn't stick in my throat a bit. The airplane should be able to fight 500 miles away from the carrier. We need a fighter that's got, uh, that's got endurance, that's got long legs. Part of an a any ACM engagement is fuel. That's where your performance comes from. The more fuel you have, the more, uh, the more you can dump that out the tailpipe to give you thrust. And that's one of the elements to weighing the fight. And so? we plan our response to the threat, keeping in mind that the criteria for a successful fighter have never changed, the goal being to balance these against the technical capabilities of a potential enemy. We're going to change our style for a few moments to review those elements that evolution, experience, enemy, and environment prescribe as necessary to success in air combat if we are to emerge with any sense of confidence or security in these times. And so, taking some liberties, we're off to the beach.
This tomcat, by the book and the convenience of animated time, has learned all the qualifications for a successful fighter that almost 60 years of fighter development has taken to achieve. His all-metal counterpart is the Grumman F-14, the Navy's new generation, no trade-off, no compromise, air superiority fighter. Designed against exacting mission requirements, it draws the past, the present, and the near future together in a single combat machine. The F-14, combining exceptional power and a variable sweep wing, has the energy and maneuverability vital to controlling fighter engagements. Tomcat's ability to automatically adjust its wing to its speed allows for unmatched agility in close turning combat. The initial impression is that a plane that size uh, just can't turn like it does. Uh, we, for years, have been watching the threat type aircraft or simulation or the threat itself from over our shoulder because they can outturn uh, any fighter we've had in, in Vietnam, F-8s and F-4s. So here we give a fighter the capability to turn when you put that in combination with the vertical capability of the aircraft, uh, you always shake in your head and say, you know, it's just not possible for an airplane to turn like this. Undoubtedly, uh, the swing wing has given the F-14 uh, an almost unique capability uh, in fighter aircraft. The, uh, with the wing forward, you have a straight wing airplane that uh, at real slow speeds, I'm really talking less than 200 knots, uh, is a fantastic turning aircraft. It compares, uh, probably compares favorably with a T-28. With a, with a wing aft, uh, the airplane uh, has surprised all of us with the, with the turn capability it has. If you look at it very simply, however, it's a delta wing airplane with a wing at, at 68 degrees. And delta wing airplanes are known turners. Tomcat's all internal fuel capacity accounts for some of its size, gives it extended range and endurance, lets it take the fight to the enemy, 
and once engaged, has the combat fuel needed to win. The F-14 is its own tanker. It carries a bag of fuel and in most cases is not required for tanking on the typical mission to get you way out there and get your way back. For instance, this airplane can leap off from the carrier with a fighter load, four missiles, spares, a full gun, a couple of sidewinders, full internal fuel, no tanks, run out 350 miles, engage for two minutes at max AB, hustle back the ship, hold overhead for 20 minutes, and land with 2,000 pounds of fuel. That's without tanking and no external tanks. Uh, this is oh, at least twice the distance as most of, us, most of us are used to as far as a range for a combat situation and a fighter roll off the carrier. The detection range of its AUG-9 weapons system is three times that of any in existence, allowing much earlier detection, initial positioning, first firing, and maneuvering for next advantage. The real capability that the F-14 has is multiple track of targets and multiple launch, simultaneous launch at several different targets. If you look at the way the Russians run, you know, run their, uh, their tactics, run their exercises, it's fairly obvious you're going to be faced with a number of different targets. This system can detect targets at ranges in excess of, of twice the range that an F-4 could do it and can track multiple targets and shoot at those guys at really long ranges. It's, a, it's a really the only, I feel, viable weapon system that, to counter the Russian threat. Taking advantage of this versatile system, the Tomcat employs both number and variety of weapons, from Phoenix missile to Vulcan cannon, can punch hard at extreme ranges, close in, and anywhere between. The F-14 has some tremendous advantages over past fighters from a backseater's point of view. In the ACM mode, you can actually see out of this airplane. Visibility is, is unrestricted or nearly unrestricted in all quadrants. You can twist in your seat enough to see right between the vertical tails, which is a tremendous asset in a dogfight situation. Controllability is this fighter's trademark at the maneuvering extremes of air combat to its behavior around the ship. An honest, safety-prone machine throughout its tactical envelope. I think the, one of the big advantages that the swing wing obviously is going to give us is the shipboard roll. Uh, we've got an airplane that is going, going to come aboard ship at less than 120 knots with the uh, design specifications on the, on the landing gear as far as withstanding high sink rates. Uh, we've got an airplane that should, I say should, have a very impressive uh, safety record. When Tomcat is based ashore, its stall-like qualities allow it to land in 1,800 feet and get airborne again in 900 feet, completing the entire evolution in less than 3,000 feet. All criteria considered, the exceptionally agile two-man swing-wing Tomcat with its versatile weapon system blends total force flexibility in all roles. Since there are no points for second place in air combat, the F-14 is by design a criteria-conscious combination of hardware and performance that allows us to match wits with any situation an enemy might create now or in the near future. The F-14 evolved from a requirement to satisfy a multi-mission air superiority fighter role while stressing high performance and close-in air combat maneuvering capability. The F-14 can take the fight to the enemy and as a dogfighter can outperform any threat airplane flying today or postulated for years to come. A careful blend of superb performance, flexible weapons loading, and combat endurance, this new generation fighter was designed for reliability and ease of employment. Though complex, it is a weapon system with a balanced combat capability, superior to the threat as we see it now, yet designed to absorb as much future technology as can be applied to threats we can reasonably predict. In reality, a fighting system with the potential to go further than our existing plans for it. Responsiveness is what we've been talking about in the fighter all along, about this fighter in particular. 
for it gives the average fighter pilot a better than average chance to defeat the enemy in air combat. The F-14, perhaps the first true multi-mission by design fighter, represents a substantial improvement in the man-machine performance relationship that gives us the initial advantage and allows us to keep it. Translating requirements and criteria into hardware has seen the orderly development of Tomcat. In the overall, a low-risk program appropriate to needs we can honestly identify, carefully match the broad scope confrontation. More importantly, it carries a two-man crew because the automation required for a one-man crew would restrict its growth, its flexibility, its safety, and in the process, its mission performance. We don't have a corner on technology, and we can be sure that any adversary will use every advantage he might have to outgun us. Today, the F-14 is what it is because it reflects all the criteria essential to, but never achieved before in any single fighter. It does not compromise one performance area for another, and its versatility will provide us with a means to respond for years to come.